Hello everybody, this is Nathaniel Nelson and this video is of a talk I gave to the Feminist Club of West High School in the month of November 2015. Uh, in this talk I discuss representations of gender and sexual minorities in video games and uh, try to explore ways that anyone can get involved in supporting the cause of feminism within video game culture. Um, parts of this video I had to recreate after the talk because of an incomplete video, but that shouldn't be a problem. So, let's get started. You might be wondering who I am and why you should listen to my opinions. So, I have been uh, devoting a lot of my time in the past few years to reading about uh, feminism within video games and the treatment of women, um, portrayals of women. Uh, I tend to play a lot of games that express feminist themes and uh, explore that side of gaming culture and I have quite a bit of experience with video games themselves being a, a gamer since really early childhood and uh, making my own games, having several years experience as a game developer, talking to other game developers, um, going to community meetups, uh, reading articles and criticism about games, writing my own criticism, uh, which you can read on my blog, and yeah, so I have a fair amount of qualification to be talking about games as art and uh, analyzing game mechanics and game themes. Uh, it's kind of my life. But I do not claim uh, out of anything I say in this video that I know more than you do about feminism. If you've done a fair amount of research into feminist writing, feminist criticism, feminist theory, you're probably already more qualified than I am. Uh, so, yeah, and uh, after, in the, in the description I'll be including a link, uh, list of links for everything that I really mention in this talk so that you can go play the games that I talk about, read the articles that I've referenced here, and uh, do your own thinking. So, yeah. You should know that when I was planning this talk, I wanted to speak a lot more in detail about the online harassment and abuse that women really often get in the gaming community. And I decided to change that and mostly refocus this talk on positive things and feminist media. So, yeah. And right about now we're going to cut into the actual video of the talk. So, see you later. Um, nitty gritty on like the treatment of women and exactly how bad it gets and um, I couldn't take it. I got pretty depressed trying to prepare that talk. Um, I was going I was always going to balance it cuz I can't just give a downer talk, but I decided to cut out like 90% of the dark stuff because I'm not in the mood and you're not in the mood. Uh, AJ. So this this is a patched version of Matthew's talk and I'm supposed to get a patch through a launcher or? <laughs> you actually have to like go through a lengthy process to figure it out. Okay, anyway, so there's Nietzsche to welcome you to this talk. Okay, um, okay, these are the rules. Uh, if you have a question about something I say, interrupt me. Uh, if you don't understand something I said, interrupt me. Uh, if you want me, um, if something I said is interesting to you and you want me to go deeper into it, interrupt me. And if you disagree, and it will take less than 60 seconds for us to figure that out and move on, interrupt me. And here we go. Um, also, the flip side of that, I'm looking at some people um, who I love, who I invited specifically because I know you don't wholeheartedly agree with my stances. Um, I'm super glad that you came, but if it's going to be something that we can't resolve and it won't be productive, please save it for later because I really want to have those conversations. In fact, write it down. Um, but yeah. And away we go! <laughs> okay. So, Spelunky is one of my favorite games in the entire universe. Uh, it's incredible. Um, the mascot is that dude who's kind of based on Indiana Jones with like his torch and his hat and everything. Um, 
and it came from it came from a prototype by a developer named Derek Yu um, that was really simple and um, it's a game about exploring a cave to get to the bottom of it and every time you die you die for good uh, but you can find and save damsels in the dungeon uh, who look like that and they like restore your health they're like a valuable resource going forward in the game is saving these damsels and you can also sacrifice them at altars to the spider goddess Kali. Um, you can sacrifice, and, and you're rewarded for doing so. You get uh, various useful items. In fact, one of the more powerful items in the, in the game. The Kapala is the most OP yeah. thing in the game. He told me about it. I didn't know about it. And then he told me, and then I beat the game because of that advice. Um, yeah, you sacrifice two of them alive, and you get the most OP game, which means overpowered. Anyway, um, so yeah. Women in the original version of the game were pretty much, um, there was no playable female character in the game. Women were exclusively like these, these objects that you pick up and move from point A to point B, and they're like a resource for you to acquire and protect and all that, uh, which is a huge pattern in video games. It's one of the tropes um, is that women are to be rescued like from the very earliest games that had people as characters. Uh, we had men saving women. Um, are you are you criticizing beta? 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 The beta. No. Beta. no. Beta. Well, I'm, I'm just. <laughs> beta. I haven't criticized yeah. anything yet. Okay. I'm not criticizing anything. Okay, okay. But I mean, it wasn't a beta. It was an original release. Actually, kind of. I am kind of criticizing it. But oh, okay. um, also, in the remastered version, which is the one I'm mostly talking about. Uh, it originally released like that, with just the damsels. Uh, they were all female. And uh, feminists in video games got kind of an upset reaction to that, because... For feminists. Right, I'm pretty sure. Okay. Uh, did they have all of the character selections from the from get -go? with the new version? I don't know, but I know that they didn't have... Okay. Um, so anyway, people got upset about that. They're like, yo, Women in your game are totally objects. They like they bounce around. You can throw them on spikes. They don't do anything. Um, and the developer said, "Oh wow, I actually I just thought it was funny, but I realized I guess I didn't really think that through so much. Uh, I'll change it. I actually don't care whether the damsel is female or not. I'll change it for you." Next slide. So <laughs> they changed. <laughs> The two greatest things ever, which are the male damsel and the damsel dog. Uh, I call him Mad Hunk. Uh, so uh, you can go in now to the game and you can set it so that these three all appear randomly. So like in any level of the dungeon, you could equally likely find the pug as that Hillary guy. Carrier, if you're in the building, uh, please call extension so 212. Find the man damsel or only find the dog. So it's like... Great, equality, right? Um, which is super cool, I think. Um, also, the fact that you have all of these playable characters, um, the majority are male or masculine, but there are some really awesome standout uh, female characters in the lineup, and you can set it so that you have this lady finding this lady and they kiss when you rescue them. Like, um, it's, pretty, it's pretty progressive because it went from a game where um, the P kisses her to a game where anyone can kiss really anyone or a dog. <laughs> the dog is the right choice. Um, so yeah, there's that. And um, my personal experience with the game is that when I first started playing it, I could have chosen any of these characters. That's kind of a simplification because you have to unlock the other ones. But to me, he was the only character. I would never play any other character because when I looked at this, I saw, wow, they're all so lame. He's obviously the only one who even looks cool at all. Um, I would never play it as him or him or, um, or him. It's just I didn't see them as cool characters. Um, and I didn't see her as a cool character. I was just like, why would anyone pick those? Like, did they put any work into these other other characters? Like, he's the only one. Um, and the more I started reading about, like, diversity in video games and equality and different kinds of people, I was like, well, okay, 
Sounds like I got a bit of a problem. And then from, from then on, when I would play Splunky, I would go out of my way to play the chubby girl or um, her and her. And like people of the different races, like the turban dude and everything. <laughs> and um, what I came to realize is that it was me who was wrong. And they're all pretty cool characters. They're all pretty well drawn and they all have like their visual personality. And by far the coolest one is the black pirate lady. She's just awesome. Um, and they're all, they're all the same to play. Like there's no difference um, other than appearance. Um, and so I always became kind of a prejudice by just forcing myself to pick the ones that I didn't identify with. Um, and then um, about a month or two ago, I was playing this game with my little cousin who I love to death. He's so cute um, and so nice and just like, um, and he loves video games. And it's all he wants to talk to me about because he knows I love video games. And so we were playing Spelunky and I had it set to the random damsels. And so I was going through finding like the man hunk and the dog and we were laughing about it. We're like, it's so it's so funny that you can find this man hunk with a bow and like and, and kiss him and everything. And we both agreed that the dog is super cute. And then my cousin said, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of funny that the only one that makes any sense is the most boring one. And I was like, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> Something's wrong here. Something in video games has changed the way my little cousin thinks so that he doesn't think that that makes sense. Um, and in the context of the game where you're in a dungeon where you're constantly dying, that's the point of the game, 90% of the game is dying. It's so much fun. <laughs> Why couldn't a man be stuck in that dungeon equally as well as a woman? Um, and it's something that's built up because he's been playing games his whole life, and the trope we have is Princess Peach. Um, and I'm not claiming to know exactly the reasons behind that psychological thing that happened, but it scared me a little bit. It made me feel like, oh, what do I do? <laughs> um, next slide. Okay, now we're getting to like the fun half stuff. So the first woman to make a video game is named Carol Shaw, and that's her. And her game uh, came six years after Pong and 31 years after either um, Tennis for Two or XOXO, which are like the first uh, video games. They weren't, it's weird. Like the first video game is something that scholars don't really Agree on. Yeah, there is no clear um, line for it. So depending on how um, depending on how you look at it, the first woman to make a game didn't do it until 31 years after video games existed, or six years. Was this a solo project? Yes. So because, this, um, this is the first female-only solo project for a video game. game right, and I don't believe that there was a woman who worked on a game even in a team before that. Because um, this is the age of like Atari where video games were solo projects, like exclusively. Or they were academic projects um, like Tennis for Two, which was made in a lab on an oscilloscope. Um, and also uh, the planet of Japanese. Um, yeah. So my best sources are that she is the first woman to work on a video game. Um, and so yeah, in my extended essay, I was using this because this was what I found and it's a more damning statistic for video games as far as equality goes. But when I was doing research for the talk, I saw it in that context and I was like, oh, maybe I'm a little bit exaggerating things. Maybe it's less of a problem. And you can look at it both ways. But she's amazing in and of herself because within five minutes of reading about the game she made, I was so happy and so impressed. Uh, the game is called River Raid. Um, next slide. She's holding it in the photo. So, um, the critical reception on River Raid, it was considered like a really fun, really well-designed game um, for its time. It looks awful, <laughs> but I'm still probably gonna go play it someday, somewhere, I'll find it. But what I was so happy with was reading uh, the reaction in Deseret News. <coughs> um, not Deseret News, the, the next thing, but like Deseret News called it one of the most playable and entertaining of all war games. 
um, and it's made by a woman, it's like awesome, like we can be just as violent and <laughs> militaristic as any other game developer. But what I really love is that in West Germany, it was the first video game to be banned for minors. And their reasoning for that is that minors are intended to delve into the role of an uncompromising fighter, an agent of annihilation. It provides children with a paramilitaristic education. With older minors, playing leads to physical cramps, anger, aggressiveness, erratic thinking, and headaches! And this is, this is video games. This is what we've been doing all along, is making kids more violent and uh, just supporting the military in, in our propaganda. But and uh, our Call of Duty is music. Yeah, Carol Shaw. Um, I love that so much. Um, next slide. Okay, so this is where the subtitle of my talk comes in. Um, I said that you have the power to help, and I meant all of you, everyone. And we're gonna start getting into how. Uh, you. Say I like me. Whatever can I do? Yeah, okay, say it, do it. I like games, whatever can I do? Good question, Liam. <laughs> Next slide. Go play games. Um, it'll be fun. I'm sorry, my dog is here. Don't apologize for your dog being here. We're all happy that your dog is okay. here. Okay, so, video games. Uh, one of the ways you can help is actually super simple and enjoyable and great. It's playing them. And I'm going to tell you exactly which ones to go play if you have no idea. If you're standing there saying, Oh, but what video games? I don't like video games. Um, if you don't think you like video games, I would argue that it's a matter of just not knowing the right ones yet. And so I'm going to try and help you get at that. Um, who, raise your hands if you do play video games and they're a big part of your life. So like most people, um, and a lot of people who don't, I'm going to try to you like, find some. So, next slide. Um, so first, uh, we should talk about Twine. Twine is one of the, my favorite things because it's, uh, it's a framework for making your games where you create basically text adventures like the, uh, like the olden days. And it's free to use. It doesn't really require any programming at all. And so tons of creators who could never make video games have gotten into it through Twine. And they're making work that's super um, unconventional and super avant-garde. I don't know. Birdland. Birdland. Yeah, Birdland is cool. And so the first one I want to talk about is called Sacrilege. And it was written by Kara Ellison. And this is a game about um, being a woman at a nightclub who wants to go home with someone, and you have four options, and they are named Matthew, Mark, John, and Luke. Um, and it, it's um, the game is a, it really it explores themes of like um, how how women are objectified and in our society, and um, like explores sex positivity. Like every um, every man you try to to get closer to has a hang up. Like they, they're best friends with one of your exes so they can't be with you. And that's, you know, that's about like the, the ownership that's created even after a relationship is gone. Or um, a man almost sleeps with you but he's married. And you learn these things and it's, it's all about like, it's something that we don't really get in games very often at all. Like. Can you think of a popular video game in the last five years that had one, like, relationship in it? One romantic relationship that was actually, like, explored in its human aspects and, like, what it does to people and how that works psychologically? It's, it's pretty hard. And, I mean, we do have romance in modern games, but you can get it so much better from books and movies. Like, there are art forms where people are, like, seriously concerned with how do people relate to each other. And video games have been pretty bad with that. And sacrilege, is, that's what it does. And, uh, <coughs> What about Catherine? Catherine, I haven't played Catherine. Okay, well I haven't either. So, um, I'm gonna take a moment and plug for the interactive fiction community in general, really good for this sort of thing. Right. 
Uh, anything by Emily Short is good. So yeah, um, there was uh, anything made by uh, same crew who did Catherine. Uh, also did No More Heroes, No More Heroes to um, Suda. That's no, right. Suda, okay. Suda. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, wait, 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 wait. No, I can tell you more. Uh, Final Fantasy VII, 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 Yeah, but. You can't just throw a list of people. Well, well I'm trying to. Like, no, just ask. Okay, okay. There's, there's 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 okay, okay. There, there are quite a bit. And the point within video games itself, usually, is that you're supposed to put yourself within these characters. And a lot of the time, what the integration from video games has been throughout the years is creating more interactivity with between the player and the system itself. You. you the system within writing is a little like writing a book or a movie is meant to be empathetic and it's meant to create more uh, characters and narratives and music and shots and so to, so things like that. But we're getting to an era within gaming where gameplay itself is actually dictating how you deal with the game. So there's there's a lot of progressiveness going on. 60 last, seconds, what are you getting at? The last 10 years, uh, it's, it's, I, I don't, and, oh, sorry, the point of that was that a lot of the time it's meant to be between the people that play the games, not between you and the game itself. The point, the interaction that you're having between the games playing the game. Okay, you're done. <laughs> so, um, it's funny because games do a really bad job of systemizing romance, like, the joke is, who here's played Mass Effect or a Bioware game before? Yeah. It's like you, 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 gifts, you give gifts to your chosen love interest until sex falls out. Like a really badly animated sex scene, right? That's, that's and, the joke about um, Bioware And games. that kind of thing generally happens based on like a deterministic system. Like the things that you say to your <coughs> love interest, like no matter what, if you say the right thing, you're going to get some. And if you go, like, if you get it wrong, you just reload your save and you're like, I was supposed to say this, I'm going to say that, and then I'm going to get some. And the message that it sends to our, to people is like, yeah, be bad. It, 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 it sends this message that, like, if you do everything right, you're going to end up with the people, like, with the person you like. And that's not always how it is. Like, um, I've read a lot of, of designers who want to make games where, Part of it is just random. Like there will be characters you just can't get because that's how real life is. Like you have no entitlement to to romance with anyone. And in video games, too much of the time you do. Um, but yeah, uh, I want to warn everybody. If it's 3:30, I don't know when I started, but if it's 3:30 now, we could be here a really long time because um, <laughs> there's there's so much more. Um, and I don't I don't care. I can. I don't got the until seven thirty, but if you have to leave, um, yeah. I mean, I think that the question is at that point, you know, to what extent is that the fault of the video game, not just like, but like the developers, not just the lack of the technology. I mean, we have. Not, oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. We, we've known how to use words forever, and that's have, like, that's a valid point. Love. So, um, the, that's a valid point. Part of the reason why. <laughs> treated women as, you know, not as complex characters and um, more as objects or things you can manipulate is because games have been constantly working out of technical limitations and we've treated everyone that way because that was what we were allowed to do, like working with text and dialogue systems, like we just didn't know how to make a system where it was more realistic or more depth in your interaction. Um, I want to say something, uh, add a rule to the list of rules. Um, if I call on you and you're saying something, um, I have the right to interrupt you. And when, when I do, shut up, because it's my talk. <laughs> well, yeah. so I, I just like to ask you guys if you can name a single video game other than Undertale, in which you can receive a rejection and then not like end up romancing the person you got rejected by. Yeah. Um, Dragon Man is two. Dragon, wait, the, the Dragon Age The, uh, um, Isabella, you, you, yeah, Isabella, you always have a cutscene where you have sex with this one character, and then she rejects you, and you can never be with this character. Oh, yeah. Okay, anyway, yeah, okay. anyway, I'm not saying that there are no examples like this. My point is that they're pretty, they're pretty few and far between, and it's getting better. Everything I talk about in this talk in a negative light is getting better, and we can see that it is. Um, I'm not trying to be a downer, I'm not trying to bash on video games because I love them to death. 
and um, there's just stuff that we can work on. That, you know. So, Queerness in Love at the End of the World is another twine game. Um, this one I recommend to absolutely everyone because it only takes 10 seconds. You can play this game in actually 10 seconds. Um, so it's, I'm not 100% sure I remember the gender, but I think it's two queer women who are the main characters. Um, the world is literally ending in 10 seconds, and you're queers, and you're in love. <laughs> and it's like, it's all told through this text and these hyperlinks, so you, can, you play it online. Twine games, you can play them all online, you don't need anything, and they're free. That's what it uh, A lot of these are really cool, and if, you, if they sound interesting, just ask me for a link, and you can play them. Um, but yeah, so you have these options of like, what are you going to do with the last 10 seconds of the universe when you're here with your lover? Um, and no matter what, in the end, uh, I should have got a screenshot of what it does, but yeah, the world ends, and there's there's nothing. Um, and so it's just really like, it's got like this frantic sense of, of like, how of trying to express your romance in such a short time and with so much pressure on it, and it's really, really, really sad, and I don't, like, you think that if you just try over and over again, you can get fast enough to like see some kind of resolution, and you really can't, it's only 10 seconds. Like, it's, it's gonna be crushing. And so I like that game. <laughs> um, it's going to be crushing. It, 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 um, it really expresses like some seriously complex and hardcore emotions that I think is, is a great experience. Um, made by Anna Anthropy, and I'm gonna be talking about more stuff from Anna later. Uh, depression quotes. This one has perked up the attention of our gamers because it's created, uh, it was created by a controversial figure. Um, but we're not talking about Zoe Quinn. Um, we're talking about the game. And in and of itself, Depression Quest is pretty cool. It's not especially feminist, but I put it in here because it's really special to me as a person. And I think it's a really important game to play. And as far as intersectionality goes, I can kind of make an argument that it belongs here. Because um, I have a feminist and I have depression. So um, so the themes that it gets into, and these are also pretty, these go back to the things that I wish we saw more of in video games. It deals with family relationships in a really human way. Um, talks about depression and depression treatment, which not only is that something that we never get in video games, that's something we almost never get in any other form of media. Uh, except Inside Out. Um, so, and, you know, the, the more directly feminist thing it does is it uses gender-neutral pronouns for a lot of the characters. Like, you can sort of pick and choose how you're going to interpret their, who the people are. Like, you, am I, has anyone else played it? Am I, am I, make, uh, anyway. Um, so I think, like, the idea is that you can play it and project your gender onto any of the characters and to the main character, and it's just, accessible to everyone in that way. Um, anyone want to like, I don't want to go super in depth into every game because that'll just take forever, but does anyone want me to like talk a little bit about how it works? Yeah, okay, so um, you have your status at all times while you're playing, where it gets into like the, your, like your condition and how deep it is at the time. And um, whether you're on medication, whether you're seeing a, any professionals, and um, it's pretty true to like actual depression in that, as far as I know, this condition has an element of randomness and uncontrollability to it for how just how depressed you are. And as you play, you're going through daily situations and trying to decide what to do. But depending on how depressed you are, options just aren't available. They get crossed out. You can't, um, you, you can't go to work um, because I can't read things because they're crossed out. But like the best and most healthy decisions that you could make in treating, in, in improving your condition are sometimes just not available because of the, the emotional state you're in and like how hard it is. And I can totally relate to that. Um, this game actually made me very frustrated. Yeah. Why? It's like I, I couldn't do anything. 
Exactly. That's, that's the point. I know that's the point, but it also made me frustrated. It's very sad, isn't it? Sad. And right. This is real life for a lot of people. Yeah. I yeah. I didn't have. I don't have that severe a case of depression, but for some people, it is just horrible, shitty, no answer. Um, yeah. Very, very sobering game. And I like that it's out there because it's someone trying to like explain complicated things to you know in a world where most people don't know about it and that's one of the big problems for people with depression is like when nobody understands your condition um, they can just say stupid things like they don't know um, what to say to you or how to make you feel better or or help out and this is the kind of game that answers a lot of those questions and makes it really accessible to people who don't have depression like the one right okay um, Dysphoria. Uh, this is also by Anna Anthropy, who did Queers in Love. Um, and it's an autobiographical game about her six month period of doing hormone replacement as a transgender woman. And um, I haven't played it. I really wanted to when I was preparing for this talk, but it costs $5 and I don't have that much time. But um, it is really, it's, it's really widely acclaimed, so if this sounds like the kind of thing you're into, um, I feel I can make the recommendation without the personal experience. Uh, it was a hugely culturally significant game when it came out, and it deals with like mechanics where you can't easily win, or sometimes it's not designed, most of the time it's not designed for you to win, and so it's designed for you to just feel like frustration and, uh, yeah. And I thought this was really cool, so I put it in the presentation. Um, they offer that if you're trans and you can't afford the game, email them and they'll get it to you somehow. That's really cool, right? Um, so yeah. So this one, Liam. Oh, yeah. Or do you okay. just for Netrunner in general? Um, <laughs> maybe. Okay, so this is a tie-in game to a card game that Liam and I play called Android Netrunner. And Netrunner itself is pretty progressive in the characters that it has. Like, it goes um, really racially diverse. It's and the only card game I know where there's a mechanically meaningful sex change, so here we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, it's a great game, and it has um, equal representation between um, genders. Yeah, and like all the top playable runners right now are all female, so yeah. yeah so it's great. a cool game. Um, but this is a this is a twine game someone made about it, like a fan game. Um, their response to it, and one portion that stuck out to me, um, and it's actually inspired ideas that I'm going to use later. But um, there's this part where it's since it's a sci-fi game, um, you're going into the virtual reality interwebs whatever by plugging in your brain and um, so you enter the, that cyberspace and you have your avatar um, and it starts when you get to this section it says that your avatar is a perfectly proportioned female body but you can click on that and so I was like okay this is probably the classic choose your gender section of a video game because a lot of video games have that if I click on it, I'm, I'm assuming it's going to make me male. And then it does. You um, So as you're cycling through these avatars, you become a muscular, hail, hairless male body. It's like, it's a statement on like, oh, the idealized woman and the ideally, uh, idealized man, like an equal representation. But then it keeps going, and that's where it gets cool. Um, you next become like an androgynous, chrome-textured humanoid figure, figure with no gender attached. Um, next slide. And you keep clicking and clicking and clicking, and the gender binary just explodes, and it's hilarious and great. Uh, my favorite one, my favorite one, and I chose this one: a massive triangle is pulsing to an inaudible beat. A V-shaped fighter jet. You could be a puff of smoke, and that's great. And the statement that that makes is like, it's a game about the future, and this is the way they see it: is that people are going to represent themselves however they want. I think that's really cool. And so. Um, I'm gonna make. I'm gonna do something similar in one of my next games. Um, the idea I have that I think is funny, uh, you can decide for yourself though. Is I'm gonna have a random gender button that just throws in like from a from a list of all kinds of things, just throws out something random like rat or cheese. Um, and in addition to that, it will have 
just a string of binary that's randomly generated, like 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1. That'll be your gender. Um, yeah, next slide. OK, Coming Out Simulator 2014 is um, it's also autobiographical. So what's his name, Nikki Case? Um, yeah. This is, so this is a game by Nikki Case that did it win? No. Yeah. It, um, it won. Which it, um, it, it won uh, autobiographical jam and was nominated in ninety at twenty fourteen. Yeah. So um, critically important game, like much enjoyed. Liam and I have both played it, and it's it's great. We recommend it. I don't know if anyone else has, but it's um, it's his story of coming out to his family as bisexual, and um, it's funny, it's sad, it's like stressful, it's drama, it kind of takes you through that experience um, in a way where you really get to empathize with it, and it's cool. Um, it's free, it's online, so yeah, next slide. Consentical. <laughs> Just look at that. Um, <laughs> uh, this is the only, well aside from Netrunner, this is the only non-video game that I've put in here. Um, it's a two-player card game, it's not out yet. Um, I want to play it so badly that I sent an email to uh, Naomi Clark asking for like a playtester copy. Um, I really hope that happens, but if not, I'm waiting. Um, and Yeah, if you don't think that's true. I I can't tell you how I know this. <laughs> but I played it online. That's sketchy. Is that illicit? Yeah. Because it hasn't, <laughs> okay. it hasn't been so publicly released as... <laughs> no, 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 not that kind of sketchy. Wait, which sketchy are you saying? <laughs> it's sketchy, but it's not that kind of I don't think it's been Legit. released. Which is amazing, it. but... It is amazing. Okay, anyway, so I really want to play this game when it comes out. Um. Liam's probably not, he's going to be a little bit too squeamish, so we're going to play it unconsensually. <laughs> you're going to play unconsensual consentical with me. Um, so this game is about a tentacled alien and a human who want to have sex with each other. They're both bound. And the whole card game is about, like, how you navigate that and what, like, finding out what the other person wants, sometimes through silent communication, um, and like trying to get the best out of it by like pleasing both people uh, in consensual ways and like the game, th like that's what the rules are. It is straight up tentacle sex. Um, and so, okay, um, how do I justify putting that in, in this talk? Um, because, because they're a non, non, it's a tentacle and it's consensual sex. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a game. The mechanics, like, um, the mechanics are actually like, this is something we super rarely see in games, is like delving into a system that's based on consent and what that means and how it works. Um, it, it, the game actually came out of a joke because someone tried to publish a right. rape card game on Kickstarter and Kickstarter took it down because it was rape. So the joke was if you made a consensual tentacle sex card game, you could put it on Kickstarter. Yeah. And so they did. Um, so yeah, and Naomi Clark is Japanese and um, half of her, ins like, that's a true story. And that another part of her inspiration is that um, she, as a child living in Japan, stumbled onto some unfortunately scarring shit on the internet. And um, throughout life, just, you know, there the, was faced with like a stereotype of like, oh, you're from Japan, that's where they have nothing but rape tentacle porn, right? And just being a little bit sick of that, um, because there's a full range of Japanese porn. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, so so uh, what, what she, uh, part of her motivation is like, yeah, that is. Yeah, that does exist. Yeah, that is a pretty problematic that we, you know, make make porn about rape and violation. What if I could turn that into something positive about consent? Uh, so yeah, who would be down to play this with me? <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Next slide. Uh, Siren for Hire is another twine game, um, and this is by Maddie Myers, who writes a lot about games, and she's written some really cool articles that I enjoy. Um, and it's an allegory about being a woman and inside the game industry and what that's like and how it's like 
um, interacting with other women in the industry. Uh, because we have kind of a narrative of like women coming together with feminism and like facing great odds and advancing their station and, and all that. And her experience is much different from that. So she made a game about being women in a hostile world and hating each other. Um, it's pretty, it's kind of a downer. But, <laughs> um, so it's about, like, um, the allegory relates to Gamergate, which I don't know how many of you have heard Gamergate, but I'm not going to talk about it because it's just not going to go there. Um, but it's a great game, and it also has a queer romance in it. Uh, Gone Home. This is what I wrote about in my extended essay. Kicking against the patriarchy. Zines. I'm right, Earl. Hmm? How many games have you There's only one more. <laughs> <laughs> Did anyone play Gone Home or heard of it? This is one of the only, yeah. Um, it's a good game. Um, I've played it twice and like my critical opinion of it is not the highest, um, but it's great. And uh, the first time I experienced this game is one of the strongest emotional experiences I've ever had with a video game. So if you've never played it, it is something that I highly recommend. And I recommend it even if you don't normally play games because um, it's not super, intensive on like controls or that you know how to play games. Um, this is a game where you go through, uh, you are, you're playing a girl coming back from her trip to Europe uh, to her family's home and they've moved while she was gone. And so you're coming to this, the, your family's new home that you've never lived in and you find that they're all missing and you don't know where they've gone so you're going into their home trying to figure out where is everybody? And you start walking through your family's life without you in this pretty alien space and you learn, um, I don't want to spoil anything. It's a game that's all about like discovering these things for yourself. And it's, I highly recommend you do it. My extended essay spoils it, all of that. But if you want to read it, um, you can. Um, but you learn like what was going on with your family while you were away and there's of, yeah, uh, it's great. Take take my word for it. Yeah, uh, this one, this game is really popular, even among people who are totally that that, that don't care about feminism or they're totally opposed to feminism. This is a popular game because it's fun as hell. Um, and you might not be pleased to know that I think it's feminist. Um, the, there are two main characters in the original Portal. They are Shell and GLaDOS, um, or Gladys, people say it, whatever. Um, Gladys is short for genetic life form and disk operating system. <laughs> and she's this, this computer, and she's pretty much a sadistic, insane dominatrix type thing who wants to kill you and like killed all the scientists in this laboratory. Um, and so the great thing is that the only characters in this game uh, were female. She's voiced by Ellen McLean, who does like a great, hilarious performance. Um, and it's just like they're allowed to exist as characters without anything. It's, it's like feminist in the minute it's not feminist. Like this is one of the first games we have where women are there and they're just there. And they're great characters, like regardless of their gender. Um, and there, there's also been people who People arguing that um, that it took traditional first-person shooter mechanics, where you're holding a gun and you're just killing people, and it's super violent and hyper-masculine and all of that, um, and they just subverted that by making you holding a gun that shoots portals, and you're using your brain to get through these crazy situations and survive. And people have um, argued that that gives it a much more feminine feel in a way that kind of like subverts that, and without without realizing it, players are playing something that's a lot more feminine than anything they're used to. Uh, Conrad. I mean, I don't know if I would say that it's, okay, so that, you know, like, it's more feminine. Like, I think it's, you know, I, I would, I, I haven't ever gotten around to, like, beating the whole game, but I've been in Portal, yeah. and I, I've enjoyed it a lot, and I don't think it's, 
because it was more feminine. I think it was just because it was it's, a more yeah. intelligent game. You know, I, I do enjoy first-person shooters, but it wasn't just a kill people, it was an intelligent game. I don't know so, I, I mean, that's what I'm just bringing up. Quality, I'm so interrupting you, and that's when you stop talking. <laughs> I'm only bringing that up um, so that you know that that's out there. That's not my opinion. I think it's um, really feminine for its characters, not necessarily because it's a subversion on uh, shooter mechanics, but that's that's out there. Those ideas are other people's. It's like the most popular game. This is like probably the first and only time I'll be able to talk in here, but because while well, I don't know anything about video games, I do know some stuff about literature and other media patterns. And yes, that is feminist, but uh, that pattern is feminine because not to say what genuine masculinity and femininity are, but the cultural constructs of masculinity and femininity. Masculinity does tend to be rooted in this sort of thoughtless violence, and femininity does tend to have this idea of avoiding violence. That doesn't mean that men are naturally violent or women are naturally peaceful, but it does mean that it's resisting the cultural construct of what you know, video games and this toxic masculinity of just shooting people without thinking about it. So, so moving on, we have... Now we have a lot of options for games that you can go play and learn more about feminism and what feminists have accomplished in game design, but uh, that only goes so far, and we need to start looking at ways that we can actually actively support these developers so that they can do more work and continue the movement. Sadly, money is the most often the most important factor that, um, that supports these people because every game developer needs to eat, or at least the vast majority do, because the vast majority are human. And specifically with the developers of a lot of the games I've been talking about, the games that come from Twine or um, the, the, the free games about developed by and about marginalized people, these developers really aren't the famous ones in video games. They struggle to get by a lot of the time, and most of them have pages on Patreon, which is a website where you can support your favorite people in making their online content. If you play any of the games that I listed and like it a lot, you can search for that developer on Patreon and set up a recurring donation whenever they put out more work, which is really cool and really valuable in keeping them making games. But I know that not everyone can do this, and um, another really important way that you can support a developer is by just writing them a message, like find them on Twitter and just say, hey, you made a game that really influenced my life and that meant a lot to me, and you did a great job, thank you. And getting messages, little messages like that can be huge for a developer because they go through a lot more than you would think. Making games is horribly difficult, and often the gaming community is really unappreciative, and uh, artists go through things like imposter syndrome, where they really feel insecurity and doubt over, over the, the impact that their work can have on the world, and so if you let them know what they've done for you and express your appreciation, that can be big. The next thing you can do is go learn more about video games. Pretty much the first stop in studying feminism in video games and game culture is the YouTube channel Feminist Frequency. They have a few series of videos that discuss video games, uh, the most important one of which is called Tropes vs. Women, and it's co-created by Anita Sarkeesian and Jonathan McIntosh, and they go through the history of games and broad trends and tropes uh, that games often use and how those deal with women and the effect that they create on society's perception of women. And these are a pretty good place to start, but I don't wholeheartedly stand with the views that they present in their videos. Uh, they are very heavily focused on games doing things wrong, and so often they look at games without acknowledging some of the more um, equitable or progressive things that they do, um, because they focus on what could be better. And I think watching a lot of their videos creates a pretty disproportionate view of how widespread these negative tropes are. And 
in researching for this talk, I tried to go looking for statistics and uh, numbers to show the prevalence of these things, and it was actually much more difficult than I expected. Um, so that was something that surprised me in doing my research. Uh, another thing to be careful of with feminist frequency videos is sometimes their interpretation of game mechanics and rules and what is or isn't incentivized in games is very clouded and they've come to some conclusions that I personally disagree with so uh, I do recommend their, their videos as a starting point. Another series I highly recommend is Why Are You So Angry by Innuendo Studios. This is a six-part series that explores the, the psychological and cultural factors that create uh, hatred and anger in game culture and why people get so upset about movements such as feminism and um, activism for equality. I think these videos are very well researched and objective and no matter which side you land on, I think there's a lot to be learned about humanity just by watching these videos. They're not local to video games. He talks about how people build up their worldview and when they truly believe something or want to believe something, how it can be very difficult to be convinced otherwise and what props up uh, falsehood in human perception. So it's definitely worth watching. The column Sexy by Kara Ellison, written for Rock Paper Shotgun, has uh, been put on hiatus now, but you can go read the complete its complete run of 29 columns in which she highlights games that deal with sex and relationships and romance, um, which are, you might be surprised to learn how uncommon they are and how little representation in our medium there has been of of human sexuality and how that's a pretty important thing to be in our art. Um, and a lot has been said about that and I highly recommend reading these articles if you're interested in that kind of thing. The website Offworld is a fantastic place to go if you want to read about weird, unusual, innovative games. They are staffed by a majority of female writers uh, with their their mission statement being to promote voices of people who are marginalized in video games. So they write about all kinds of perspectives you wouldn't get from a normal gaming site. Uh, they, uh, they're, they're, they're my favorite place to read about games on the entire internet. So yeah. Perhaps the biggest thing you can do to support feminism in video games is to go out and make your own video games. And this is actually surprisingly accessible. You, if you have some free time, could actually get started on it today using resources like Twine that I mentioned elsewhere in the talk. Twine is a free tool for creating interactive fiction. This was used to create a lot of the games I highlighted earlier. It's it's completely free, it's very simple to learn, it actually you can go online, look, look up tutorials and start teaching yourself to make twine games in a matter of hours. All you need is access to the internet. And the games it creates are also very accessible. They export to HTML files which you can upload anywhere on the internet and have your games hosted for anyone to play with very little barrier to entry, which is awesome. Go look up twine. If the kind of games that you want to make are a bit too complicated for Twine, if they involve graphics, uh, sprites, like um, animation, you're going to need to find other frameworks for game development, and they are out there, and they there are also free frameworks for making pretty much any kind of game you can think of. And the uh, utility created by Zoe Quinn is uh, called Sorting Hat. It helps you decide exactly which framework is right for you. You go through a series of questions about the kind of games you want to make and what platform you're working on, and it will tell you exactly where to go and how to learn to make the kind of games you want to make. So go to Sorting Hat. 
thank you very much for listening. That's all I have to say to you. Um, very much appreciate to have your comments. And yeah.